In 1975, renowned film critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert launched a weekly television program called Sneak Previews, which became later known as At the Movies with Siskel and Ebert, in which the two would share their opinion on upcoming films. Part of their appeal sprouted from the simplistic thumbs-up scoring system, where they would ultimately sum up a film with a scale ranging from two thumbs up as a top recommendation and two thumbs down meaning total condemnation. The show was a major success, raking in millions of viewers each week, and they became two of the most iconic film critics of all time. Though a high score from them was considered worthy of significant praise, Siskel and Eber became more infamous from their scathing negative reviews, making them a force to be reckoned with in the industry. I hated this movie. Hated, 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 hated this movie. Hated it. Siskel and Ebert changed the face of criticism, and with their reviews becoming more popularized, they each enjoyed prosperous lifelong careers as film critics. The two's legacy would endure for decades to come, helping bolster the careers of fellow critics like Richard Roper, who worked alongside Ebert for many years after Siskel's death, and Leonard Malton, who literally wrote the book on movie reviews in everyone's living room, all the way to influencing modern critics like the angry video game nerd and the nostalgia critic. Even today, on this prosperous website YouTube, you can see how their legacy endures with countless meaningless soulless top 10 countdowns that are so uncannily specific in an attempt to connect with anyone for that sweet monetized gold, nonsensical so-called reviews that are riddled with such hyperbole and bad jokes it qualifies more as obnoxious stand-up rather than actual film criticism of any quality, and grown men in their late 20s spending way too long whining about how much they hate a cartoon meant for seven-year-olds. Sheesh. What happened? When did we let critiquing anything get so utterly screwed up like this? When did we succumb to this obsession with numbers and scores and rankings? When did someone's harmless opinion about someone's work fester into an offensive attack on one's character? Why do we care so much about what other people think about what we like or don't like, and why do we judge accordingly? Why can't we all agree that in this vast, media-centric world, there are going to be differences that we have to accept that- Because negative criticism is easy and fun and you can get paid big bucks to do it on YouTube. Oh. Wow. People make money off this trash? Something has to be done, though. I'm a busy, busy guy. I don't have time to sit for an hour and a half to listen to some mouth breather explain to me in full detail why they personally thought this particular episode of Johnny Test was especially bad. No, we need a new style of review. Something that can still capture the appeal of the average Joe on YouTube, yet something that still harkens back to the pedigree of criticism like Siskel and Ebert. Something quick and catchy that anyone can enjoy, yet still carries the weight and depth and respect of a real review. Pondering this, I consulted Dr. Malton's 1997 dissertation on the subject of brevity in film criticism, and together with the help of a team consisting of Harvard physicists, the world's top-tier mathematicians, leading CEOs of media publication companies, and English majors, I have devised a solution. Introducing the five-sentence review. A formula designed to condense long-winded reviews to just five easy sentences. Observe, the first sentence acts as an introduction to the work describing what it is. The second sentence acts as a first impression, what you first thought going in, subtly adding some additional info for the viewer in the process. The third sentence acts as a transitional phrase, which our team has determined to be labeled as the mid-peak twist, connecting the second and the fourth sentences, which gives the viewer an idea as to where the review will probably end up being, positive or negative. This is a critical sentence, and perhaps the most unpredictable. The fourth sentence, however, is, quite simply, how good or bad the critic thought something was. This is where the opinion part of the review shines. And lastly, the fifth sentence exists for the sake of the writer itself, neatly and cleanly summarizing everything from the previous four sentences into one clear, concise sentence to close out the review. For the sake of progress, though, our team has controversially decided to forego a numerical score, but instead, usage of a single word that could potentially be used to describe the body of work. Confused? Well, it's actually quite simple. I'll give you a few examples. Take this five-sentence review of the anime Devilman Crybaby, for instance. Devilman Crybaby is a Netflix adaptation of Go Nagai's popular manga Devilman. Director Masaki Yuasa's colorful animation style and writer Ichiro Okuchi's characterizations will immediately please any casual anime viewer. But, like its source material, its over-the-top dark storyline and explicit adult style won't please everybody. The show's second half takes things a little too far, which contrasts with the more humorous first half. While it is a delight to watch, Devilman Crybaby's more extreme moments hampers the exciting and refreshing animation style as a whole.
Overall, the word we would use to describe Devilman Crybaby would be grotesque. There, see? It's easy. It could, of course, work for films, too. Uh, here's one for the new Cloverfield movie. The Cloverfield Paradox is the third movie in the Cloverfield franchise, directed by Julius Ona. It takes the series into a science fiction setting, dealing with energy crises and alternate dimensions. But even though the film takes place in space, it still feels grounded as ever. The film's weak characters and flimsy storyline make me wish I was watching 10 Cloverfield Lane instead. Overall, Paradox relies too much on cliches and aimless plot lines for it to really astound anyone. Overall, we describe it as middling. Oh, wow. This is fun. <laughs> uh, do people get paid to do this? I wonder. The Simpsons Season 29 is the 29th season of the long-running primetime animated television show The Simpsons. This season continues the tradition of more crazy scenarios and even more celebrity guest cameos. Though the show has gone on for far longer than anyone needed, the fact that it's not cancelled yet is a testament to its cultural lastability. The few laughs that were produced were probably more than anyone thought would still exist after 30 years. Overall, while it of course is not as good as its earlier outings, Simpsons Season 29 is still leagues better than shows like Forget About It. We describe it as enduring. Wow. Gretchen was right. I, I reviewed a children's cartoon with my dignity intact! Dude, imagine if I made one of these per video. I'd be the richest critic in the whole world! Uh, what about... The Witcher 3 is the third game in the popular Witcher series, created by CD Projekt Red. Players play as Geralt of Rivia in his epic quest to find his adopted daughter. The game boasts beautiful graphics, an epic story, and hundreds of hours of content. I got it three years ago, and I'm still playing it without loot boxes or any of that crap. Uh, overall, Witcher 3 provides an unforgettable adventure that players will be coming back to for a long time yet. We describe it as adventurous. Oh my god. I can review anything I want, can I? Mexican food eating show Mukbang Watch Me Eat is a YouTube video of a girl eating Mexican food. It was released by Blonde Sundoll 4 MJ on December 24th, 2016 and has over a million views. The woman spends over 20 minutes literally eating her takeout chipotle, talking about basically nothing. Much like her meal, I couldn't stomach to finish the rest of the video. Overall, MFESMWME -E offers a full course meal, but its limited appeal will have viewers starved for content. Spoiled. Oh wow, this is better than what Kyle had predicted. We don't need to limit ourselves to traditional media. We can review things like... Things like... John Cage's 4 minutes and 33 seconds, or just 4.33, is a song written without music. Its minimalism deals with the significance of what is defined as actual music, suggesting the four and a half minutes of silence is its own music, nothing what the composer intended. Although given a rudimentary concept, one wonders why a shorter time wasn't considered. By minute one's end, the message becomes clear, and the rest is just unneeded filler. Ultimately, as a concept piece, 433 works well, but as an actual song, it is lacking somewhat. And we would describe 433 as quiet. Martin? Yeah. Yeah, I know what time it is in Oxford. Yeah. Yeah, the formula. Yeah. Look, look I don't care what time Leo's trick test is. You tell him we got a breakthrough. Yeah. No. No, no. Tons of data. We've reviewed anything we can think of and it still works. Look, I can review watching grass grow. <clears throat> watching grass grow is the act of sitting and watching the gradual progression of the growth of grass. The act is sometimes seen as a metaphor for something that one would rather watch or do than something unpleasant to the speaker. However, despite its negative connotation in society, in small doses, watching grass grow can have its own benefits. What it lacks in stimulation, it offers fresh air, a meditative opportunity of self-reflection, and a cursory understanding of basic plant biology. Overall, while grass growing may slip under the radar for some, those watching will probably like what they end up seeing. Enriching. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, can you tell him? What? Stop. <laughs> no, I'm just getting started. Look, we, look, 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 we have lab perfect conditions right now, so we need to continue. I'll talk to you later. I have new thresholds to cross. That popping sound in your ears is an imbalance of pressure in the eustachian tubes located in the ear. The crackling sound is usually produced by an air bubble entering from behind the middle of the nose, but can also be triggered by a drastic increase in altitude. While the sensation is at first pleasing, continued popping led to more irritating results. I'd get less popping from pouring pop rocks down my cochlea than another trip down the Rockies. Overall, that popping sound in your ears may pop with some, but crack with others. 
we describe it as snappy. Paper is a material used typically in displaying messages and information in writing or by ink through printing presses. Its usage has been enjoyed for hundreds of years and its methods of relaying information have increased in that time. However, as time goes on, it is quickly becoming obsolete with more pragmatic writing devices like touch-activated screens. I'm just saying, I've bled more times thanks to paper than the zero times my phone ever made me bleed. Overall, paper is still a good way to write things down, but it's on its way to the recycle bin. We describe it as paper thin. The Marshall Islands are a sovereign island nation just off the side of the international date line. It is associated with the United States and has a population of over 50,000. Despite its solidarity and its reclusive place in the world, the Marshall Islands is a vast and prosperous nation. I've never been, but I'm sure they're nice. Overall, the Marshall Islands are great, made only better with the possibility of an all-expense paid tour provided by YouTube. We describe it as... Wanderlust. Last week's garbage is the stuff I had thrown out in my garbage bin anywhere from three to seven days ago. Among its many contents, it includes old paper towels, old leftovers, discarded chip bags, and pounds upon pounds of pounds of cat shit. Though there is some nostalgia to be had, the offensive odor of the garbage is really what ruins the entire experience. It must be the cat shit. While the trash serves as a footprint of the past, last week's garbage should go into the garbage bin where it belongs. We describe it as odorous. Space is the endlessly open vacuum that lies outside of Earth's atmosphere. It houses trillions of square miles of stars, galaxies, and planets of immeasurable proportions. One might gawk at these implausibly big numbers, but far enough into the experience I find myself wanting more. The first million miles are like all the millions after it. There is not too much variety within space. Overall, while the first couple billion miles of the vastness of space will amaze and encapsulate, the other trillion are much of the same. We describe it as existentialist. Wait. Wait, that's it. Existence! I can become the ultimate god reviewer and review all of existence! And with the five-sentence review, it's mere child's play. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Here goes. Existence is the concept of living reality any being on any verifiable plane of existence should have. If you are real, then you exist, making you part of existence. While existence is nice, being alive and being conscious of complex ideas, it leads to a lack of focus on existence's part. Without much of a purpose or reason to exist, existence as a whole offers no reason to exist. Overall, while existence exists, if existence didn't exist, who would still be around to exist to buy a ticket that doesn't exist? And my word to sum up all of existence is... Reviewing is the age-old pastime of critiquing a person's work through observation and opinion. Criticism is fun to read and take part in, and also fun to show to other people who also love to read and take part in. However, over time, and thanks in part to the internet, glorification of reviewers and the scores they produce have put the practice of reviewing into a negative light. Capitalism has also shaped criticism into this cesspool of terrible opinions. In conclusion, while reviewing can be fun, overall, people should just shut the fuck up. Reviewing gets a negative 4 out of 10. April Fools!